good afternoon, everybody, and uh, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Alison Meston. I'm the Director of Communications at the International Science Council, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody to our ISC Distinguished Lecture Series as part of the International Year for Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. This has been an ongoing lecture series that we have done in partnership with the ISC's GEO Unions. And today I'm really excited to welcome uh, Professor Nuno Cavallo, who will be talking to us about the energy sustainability for net zero radio communications. I have to say it's a topic that I'm fascinated by but know little about. And I'm excited to learn today what kind of discussions are taking place in this important field of science as the race to net zero begins, uh, particularly timely just before COP28 happening in the Emirates. And, uh, and of course, we're at the cusp of the international decade for science for sustainable development. So I'm just going to bring on uh, Professor Cavallo for just a quick hello. Uh, so welcome, thank you so much for joining us today. What can people expect from your lecture today? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's, it's really an honor to be talking to this amazing audience. And uh, on behalf of RC, I want also to, to thanks for this invitation. So today I will talk briefly about uh, how can we reduce batteries in, in uh, electronic sensors? That's the main issue, but I will, during this process, I will talk briefly also about wireless power transmission and how we can pick up the ideas of Tesla from the 19th century and, and become or transform it in, in a real uh, solution for, for sustainable electronics services for the future. So I hope you like the, the talk. Fantastic. So I'm going to invite everyone to settle in for this lecture um, but being presented today, and then we'll have a short moment afterwards for any questions or discussion. So Professor Cavallo, we'll see you in a little while, and we'll hope everyone enjoys your lecture. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Gabriella, um, who will now um, start the lecture. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Depends on the part of the world you are. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk and to address your community. And it's really a pleasure to be here today to talk about <clears throat> what my group has been doing in the last years. And the topic of my talk today is on energy to sustainability for net zero radio communications. And my name is Nuno Borges Carvalho. I'm a professor at the University of Aveiro, and I'm also a senior researcher at the Telecommunication Institute in Portugal. So before I actually start, I want to uh, explain a little bit of what is my motivation to being starting to talk about net zero radio communications and the issue of energy sustainability. Before I, as I said, I, I go to the topic of the talk, um, I want to share with you some of the graphs that actually came from our world in data. So these are uh, recent statistics of where our energy comes around the world. And as you can see in the first graph that I'm sharing here in this slide, you can actually see that most of our energy does not come from clean sources. Most of our energy comes from coal, oil and gas. And actually, if you look to the overall world and where the energy is being consumed, when you look to all the world, you actually see that most of the energy is actually being consumed as expected in the countries that have more industry. So uh, as you can see here, you see United States, China, India, Russia, Brazil, and some parts of the world, Germany and so on. So you actually look to the world and you see where the energy consumption is being uh, used and the problem and the real need for energy at this moment. But if you look not to the overall energy, if you look specifically to electricity, so where 
our electricity comes from, you can see that when we go for electricity only, the oil reduces, the gold is a significant part of the production of our electricity, gas is also a significant part of that. And then if you go for low carbon, you have nuclear, hydropower, and all the other uh, clean energies that we have. But even here, what you see is that 63.3% of our energy continues to be, or our electricity, sorry, continues to be produced by fossil fuels. And of course, this has a huge um, uh, climate impact, uh, as you know, in this scenario. Of course, if you look only to electricity versus the total energy that we need, uh, we, in the electricity part, we are much better. And this is mainly because hydropower, wind and solar is becoming a significant part of that. And we need actually to bring and to increase this number. Well, another graph that I think is very interesting to see is the electricity assets. What that means? If It means that if you want to have electricity at your home, what is the availability to request electricity to go to your home? What I want to say with this is imagine that you are in your home and you want to have a cable that goes to your home and deliver electricity to the home. And what you can see is that most of the world, it's, I will not say easy, but at least you can have this access, that this access to electricity, but there are certain parts of the world where this is not possible or it is very difficult. And unfortunately, most of that is based in Africa. But uh, that does not mean that only Africa has problems, because when you look to this graph, you see that, of course, the sub-Saharan Africa, it's significantly impacted. You have uh, uh, South Asia continues to have a significant uh, burden when you need electricity, but you continue to see Europe, you continue to see North uh, Africa, you continue to see Latin America. So other countries that you assume that you have electricity at your home, they are continue to strike and to fight to have this electricity to be delivered to all uh, our citizens. And this is really one problem if you think a little bit of that. And one solution for that could be to have electricity on demand and to have a different style to actually deliver electricity to your home. Well, but imagine that we want to go completely uh, out of, let's say, fossil fuels for electricity production. And we want to create a pure, clean electricity production. Of course, uh, the two most significant ones are uh, the possibility to have um, solar panels or the um, possibility to have wind power. Well, what is the problem with both of these um, technologies is that they have they are not continuous, they are intermittent. So uh, if you don't have wind, you cannot have wind power. If you don't have sun, you cannot have solar panel um, production. You cannot have photovoltaic production. So these technologies are quite good, but they still have a problem. They still have the problem that if you don't have a continuous flow of energy, what will happen when you cannot feed your grid with electricity? Well, one of the possibilities, and I will talk about this today in, in a different concept, but one of the possibilities would be to go back to uh, what Tesla actually proposed in the 19th century by actually transmitting energy using radio frequency signals. So if we were able to transmit energy using radio frequency signals, then potentially you will have the capability to produce the energy where you have it. For instance, you could uh, use the solar panels in the parts of the world where you have actually sun, and then you can transmit energy back to your home using a wireless signal. So we'll talk briefly about that uh, during the discussion today. And one possibility, of course, to actually move and to implement this concept of Tesla that is producing energy, 
send the energy via radio frequency, electromagnetic waves through the air, and then collect it at your home, one possibility to do that is actually what it's called space-based solar power. What is this? Well, space-based solar power is the concept where you can actually collect the energy in space, outside the atmosphere, you can uh, then bring that energy, that solar energy, back to an RF signal and then beam that RF signal back to Earth. Why is this important? Well, because if you beam that energy back to Earth, the satellite in space could have 24 hours a day solar energy, and then you can actually brought that energy to a specific place in Earth and deliver that energy with a high efficiency solution and in a continuous mode because we are going to be in space. And uh, since we are in space, we will not be uh, um, perturbed, let's say, by our atmosphere uh, uh, sit situation and scenario. Well, if you look, this is um, can actually come to your mind as a science fiction goal. But if you look carefully, you see actually that this is being done already um, for several years, or I think, not done, sorry, but thought uh, for several years. Actually, the images I have here comes from NASA some years ago. And you can see that uh, actually more recently, uh, the Chinese uh, colleagues are thinking of implementing a similar solution. And more recent European Space Agency started also to look and start looking how can we build a solution like this for several applications. And actually, uh, in Europe, the biggest project that actually started on this aspect is called Solaris. And it started uh, actually two years ago on thinking, how can I collect energy out of space? And how can I have a clean source of energy continuously from space to Earth without jeopardizing all the systems? I can tell you actually that this looks like science fiction, as I said, but if you look to the uh, actually to the economical reports that have been put together this is a feasible solution in terms of finances uh, but we are a significant uh, road to go in terms of technical content and not terms of research that's why i think uh, having research and having uh, uh, groups around the world working on this area it's very very important well but Today, and despite I actually started with this major approach for solar-based uh, power satellites, I'd say collect the energy out of space and bring it to ground by air, uh, wireless uh, signals. Uh, if you go, you see that before we get to these very large structures and very large impact of how, the, how energy is produced in Earth, we can actually go for a more reasonable solutions that can be used on Earth and can be used in smaller scales. And uh, one of these uh, um, goals and one of these um, issues that we have at this moment is ICT technology. ICT means information communication technologies. And if you look to the information communication technologies, information communication technologies everywhere. And actually, one of the most, uh, and I will say, one of the biggest trends in ICT is really the in, what it's called the Internet of Things, where you will love to have gadgets and actually devices sensing the environment, measuring the environment, giving you feedback of the environment. But if you think a little bit, the problem with this Internet of Things massively deployment is really the amount of energy you need to actually operate these Internet of Things solutions. So let's look now mainly to this problem of the energy and ICT problem, how the internet information communication technology is impacting the energy consumption around the world. And you can see here, this actually comes from a GSM 
uh, GSMA uh, report, you can see that uh, at this moment, uh, I will say this moment means 2021, where this report was done, you see that ICT is already responsible for 4% of global electricity use. So what we are saying is that ICT, so information communication technology, is actually responsible for 4% of global electricity use. But what we can see here on the same report, and actually the report is available online, is that between 10 to 20% of electricity consumption will come from ICT in 2030. So what I'm saying is that despite energy's big problem, if you look specifically to the ICT issue, we see that ICT issue will be responsible for a major impact on our electricity consumption. But uh, uh, if you look also to how we are going to impact electricity consumption, the impacts of emerging trends, you have blockchain will be a huge and will demand a significant amount of energy uh, from the electricity production, the Internet of Things, as I said, is, it will become a very, very big hot topic and it will have an impact on how we use our electricity. And uh, we all talk about ChatGPT and artificial intelligence and so on. But if you collect all these machine learning algorithms, they will have a huge fingerprint on how we are going to spend our energy. Actually, these three points uh, were written in a, a, a rep report from the United Kingdom and Parliament in 2022. And if you look to the graphs, and these some of these graphs you see here, annual terawatts consumed, this is the predicted um, consumption in different sectors from the ICT technology. And it's not important to look carefully to each graph. What is important it is that the lines are growing every year, and this is a major problem. And even if you look to what it's called the 5G mobile communications, you see that in one of the reports, actually the report is available online, you see that while it's true that the per bit energy using is lower in 5G, the higher number of bits moving through a 5G system means that 2.5 times 5G will be higher 2.5 times compared to what 4G was. That means if we all move to a 5G solution, probably the amount of energy we'll need for the 5G solution is quite huge. It's very huge and will have a huge impact on how we live our uh, daily life. And actually, if you look to this graph here, this graph actually comes from a, a data um, sheet from a power amplifier manufacturer. And this data sheet uh, is for a power amplifier for a base station for 5G. What you see, this is the output power. This is the uh, actually the gain of the amplifier, and this is the efficiency of the amplifier. What efficiency means is how much power I have to consume to produce a certain radio frequency energy. And what you see, the efficiency goes up to 40%. 40%. What that means means 60% is consumed is actually lost. And is lost in what? Is lost in it. So the power amplifier loses. 60% of his consumed energy in it. And what you do if you want to control the temperature? Well, in most of these base stations, you use um, air conditioning. And by using air conditioning, the overall efficiency of the system comes down and down and down. And I will probably say that probably 10 to 15% is the overall uh, actual efficiency of your system when you use these type of solutions. So one big importance that we need to have is really to take care of how much energy I will need to operate the future ICT technology scenarios. Well, the same is true if you look to the IoT scenario.
Well, if, when you look to the IoT scenario, so the Internet of Things, what the Internet of Things means? Well, it means that you, I'm going to have sensors all over my place. I'm going to have sensors all over my car. I'm going to have sensors all over my city to become a smart city. I will have sensors in my clothes. I will have sensors in my body. So I want to put sensors everywhere. And most of these sensors will be battery powered so again this comes from a report and it's it's actually an old report i believe now things are much worse than they were before you see here that it is predicted that the battery powered iot devices will go up tremendously and if you look to this graph you see that this is the standby energy what that means it means that the sensor will be in standby mode consuming probably microwatts nanowatts the problem is not the nanowatts each sensor consumes. The problem is that if you multiply these nanowatts by trillions of sensors, you will have a huge impact on the overall energy that it consumes. Well, more important than that is this graph here. What you see in this graph is the energy for battery manufacturing. What that means? Well, it means that if you have a battery, a pack of batteries, the amount of energy you need to produce that battery is three to four times the amount of energy the battery contains. So what you see here is actually the amount of energy I will need to produce the batteries also. And I'll give you a simple example. How many batteries I will need to do a simple thing, to actually have a TV remote control in my house. In, most of you probably have a TV in your house and you use a remote control to change your TV. And I will believe that in your house, you'll probably use the TV for two to three hours per day, no more than that. And even if you use your TV by two or three hours per day, what we did in Portugal, actually, you, you can see here, um, Europe, and Portugal is a very tiny country. We found that only in Portugal, we are spending around 23.2 million batteries that are being wasted every year only for the TV remote control. And what is the problem of these batteries that you use for these remote controls? Well, the problem of these batteries is that at the end, they don't go to garbage. So you don't, uh, sorry, they don't uh, are used. At the end, most of them go to garbage or they try to be recycled. And when they go to garbage or you try to recycle them, you need energy to actually implement uh, techniques to recycle them or you need energy and you need power and money to actually collect all this garbage and this is again a huge impact on society and a huge impact on our climate and how we manage our climate change using this or the problem of these batteries so what can we do well we can start to harvest clean energy we can go and try to have the most clean energy we have in the world and we can do that by using energy harvesting. I will go through some of the processes you can do for very tiny. You see, I'm not talking about the megawatts I talk when I was talking about the Tesla approach to have solar based power. No, I'm talking about very tiny amount of energy. Well, we can reduce the battery need by using the same concept as Tesla, wireless power transmission and wireless power transmission combined with micro generation in, e with, in each of these sensors this can actually be very good and of course we can improve the energy efficiency of all our electrical devices this from my point of view is the most important thing we can actually change the paradigm of our wireless components for these ict solutions and i will talk in this presentation about backscatter well energy harvesting where can you harvest energy well you can harvest energy as i show you before from kinetic energy light energy heat energy or rf energy and uh, depending on what type of material or what type of technique you use to harvest energy you can produce from microwatts or uh, small um, values of power up to very huge amounts of power and this depends of course if you are using thermoelectric photovoltaic pyroelectric and so on and so on so each one of these 
can actually produce a certain amount of power. And of course, this amount of power that you produce will have an impact on how much power you need to use for your Internet of Things solution. And this Internet of Things solutions goes from consumptions of near 10 nanowatts for standby solution up to watts if you want to power up, for instance, a desktop or a laptop or something like that. And I strongly believe that when you go for these Internet of Things approaches, you should not use a single harvester. You should combine a huge amount of harvesters and you should collect all this energy for your device and from my point of view we need to change the batteries and use for instance a super capacitor or something like that because the issue is not to actually have power for a lot of uh, time a, a large um, uh, number of of hours but actually to have a continuous production of energy to be able to allow your supercapacitor to have energy all the time. Well, uh, this brings me to what we are doing in uh, Aveiro. So I'll talk uh, briefly about some of the activities that we did on wireless power transmission, on backscatter communication, on energy harvesters, and uh, more recently on how we can actually integrate all these in a, a microwave monolithic integrated circuit. And when we combine all these, we call all these technologies swapped simultaneously wireless information and power transmission. And this is what I will talk uh, actually from my group uh, is being doing the last years. Well, here I give you an example, a very simple example of what we can do for Internet of Things. Uh, we can actually collect the wind power. Uh, this is being done for very large structures, as you know, to produce megawatts of power. But you can actually harvest a small amounts of power by using what we called micro generation of uh, wind turbines. And uh, one example, actually what you see here, this is a turbine that we use in our country in most of, uh, actually, sorry, uh, in most of our um, um, chimneys in the in the apartments and this is actually put in the chimney so that birds and things do not get into the chimney but they are when you have wind they are continuously running so actually what we did we connect one of these uh, turbines small turbines to a, a power generator and this power generator is connected to a internet of things for smart cities the internet of things sensor in this case is actually measuring temperature and humidity and is sending this information using a, a, a wireless communication protocol called LoRa one to actually give you an overview of the temperature and humidity in the city you can put other sensors of course if you need well we can also use uh, what it's called not only thermal um, uh, harvesters small harvesters or you can as as these colleagues here have done you can put solar panels on top of antennas and if you put solar panels on top of antennas what we can do we continue to have the same radiation aspect of my antenna but you are harvesting solar energy if you need for your sensor well if you use um, solutions for thermal heat you can use the temperature difference and to produce certain amount of power for your device or as i said before you can also use wireless power transmission and the concept as i told you comes from tesla the concept is very simple you have a rf a dc to rf converter which is nothing more than rf oscillator you normally amplify that signal you have a transmitting antenna receiving antenna rf to dc converter which is nothing more than a diode rectifier and then sometimes you have a dc to dc converter what is the problem with this wpt solution uh, well the problem is that if you look to the efficiencies of each one of these elements the efficiencies are not 100 percent so when you want to know the the efficiency from dc to dc you actually see that the overall efficiency is very low because the efficiency is the multiplication of each one of these efficiencies. And when you multiply them all, for instance, I'll give an example, two 90% efficient solutions if put 
in series, you'll get 81% of it overall efficiency so what happens is that the overall efficiency is the multiplication of these all of these efficient individual efficiencies and this reduces significantly your overall efficiency more important than that when you transmit your signal if you are on the far field you normally use the freeze formula this is what we do when we do a telecommunication scenario what is the problem here well the problem here is that if you use the far field approach, you lose all your power. So your transmitting antenna and your receiving antenna should not work on the far field. They should work on the near field or on the Fresnel zone. And this is a very important uh, issue on this topic. You, We need to have both of them in the near field or Fresnel zone. That does not mean that you are not far away. You can be far away. It depends on the frequency and wavelength of your uh, scenario and depends, of course, on your uh, the effective area of your receiving antenna. So we have to combine all that so that we don't use and we don't go for the far field approach. And you can say, well, this is good, but Tesla showed this, but then nothing happened. Well, I'll give you some examples that of things that are already uh, working. Uh, one is um, actually, this was published in 2021. This company of Xiaomi is a mobile uh, phone, a Chinese mobile phone uh, company. They are actually claiming, and this is online, that they are working on a solution that can charge your mobile phone in your living room without uh, inductive coupling, so without putting your phone on a base. So you can use your phone around the room and it will be charging all the time. Well, other solutions that are being put together, and in this case, <laughs> sorry, is using um, inductive coupling is to for the um, transportation electrification so that you can actually power all these devices behind the road so you have an inductor in your car or your truck and you have an inductor on the road and you charge your car when it's driving well this was actually um, showed up a very simple example was showed up by nasa astronaut Jessica Mayer, and actually this was an experiment for the Naval Research Lab. You, you can see it there, you can, you can actually download. She actually showed that you can harvest small amount of power even inside the ISS uh, station. Why? Because you have Wi-Fi transmitters, you have a lot of radio frequency around. So you can harvest this radio frequency uh, by actually rectifying the signal that comes to your antenna. And uh, I already said, but this goes back to the concept of Tesla, and this goes back to the 19th century, but it only had a major change in the 60s, in the 20th century, with William Brown, when he actually invented the Hectenna. The Hectenna is nothing more than an antenna connected with a diode, with a rectifier, and actually showed that uh, in the first long-range WPT experiment, where you can see the photo here, but here you can see the sketch on the patent. You have a reflector, you have a transmitter. This transmitter goes to his reflector. Then you have a beam that actually goes to this helicopter. Well, the helicopter was nothing more than a, a, a helis uh, connected with an antenna. Man, and this was um, connected to this uh, mast using a, f a wire so that this does not fall. But he was able to actually put his uh, motor working with this uh, wireless energy being beamed from the ground. What is the problem here? The problem here is actually that this worked so well, and I can tell you that the record William Brown made with this experiment until today, it's very hard to beat his record. Why? Actually, uh, he did a very interesting and, 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 and very um, clever uh, solution. Because if you design this reflector, you see that the uh, reflector will create a convergence of electromagnetic beams. And the focus is more or less here. So when he put his antenna, he collect most of the energy that was being transmitted. And that was a very good achievement and very good idea from him. So the transmitting and receiving antenna 
war in the near field or the, the Fresnel zone, uh, as you say. Well, uh, in Aveiro, we did a certain experiment similar to this approach, but in, instead of using a reflector, we use uh, an active antenna array. So we design a 16 element uh, active array, and we have several sensors uh, that were um, separated by two to 10 meters. And what we did, we actually have a beam that goes to the room and uh, each one of the sensors, when the beam goes to him, he informs the transmitter how much power he's receiving. And by knowing how much power each one of the sensors are receiving in the second round, so it, it does a first round uh, using a, a beam, a scanning beam, then in the second round, he will try to focus on each one of the elements that answered back in the first round, and will he will opti optimize the amount of power, the radiation diagram, so that we can charge each element individually. And here you can see actually this, the, what happens when you have one, two, three, and four diodes uh, being worked together. Well, but this actually allow me to reduce the amount of power I have in each one of these sensors. But this does not allow me to actually reduce the amount of power each one of these sensors need to transmit back the information to my receiver. So in, in order to implement what is called the simultaneous wireless information and power transmission, we go back to another very well-known person, Marconi. And we go back, why? Because most of the sensors today, they use a super heterodyne or an homodyne transceiver. So we went back and see super heterodyne or homodyne transceivers actually consume a lot of energy. If you look to a super heterodyne trans uh, receiver or transmitter, what you see, you see actually that we have low noise amplifiers, we have variable gain amplifiers, we have power amplifiers, we have ADCs, DACs, mixers, oscillators. So all these components consume energy. And this is a big problem. We need to come up with an idea where we can actually transmit a wireless signal, receive a wireless signal without any uh, power consumption. And uh, I'll give you an example. Imagine that you have a black room. What you see in this slide is really that. We have a black room. This is my black room. And I imagine that I want someone is standing here and you'll see that someone is really standing here. And I want this person to reply back to me. I want this person to talk to me without using any energy consumption. So what I did in this scenario, I switch on a light, a lantern. So I have a light in my hand. I point that light to this part of the room. And what you're going to see, let me see if I'm able to connect my, whoops. Okay, let me go and I will switch this and you'll see actually on the other side of the room, I, I put there my, my daughter and my daughter uh, will communicate with me without using any energy. And you'll see how. Let me play it. What you see there is that my daughter has in her hand a mirror. So each time she changed the mirror, what you see is that she sent me back some information. It can be, if imagine that she wants to do a um, digital bit, what she will do, she will change a uh, reflection, no reflection, reflection, no reflection. And this will mean one zero, one zero. Of course, you can say she's using a little bit of power because you need to change the mirror. And this is really the concept behind it. This is not new. This goes back to several years ago. And actually what you see here are a, is a photo of the uh, First World War uh, militaries, uh, where they actually were using not a lantern, they were using the sun. And they were sending back Morse code to their uh, receiver using almost no power, no batteries involved, you see. Uh, you just have to change the mirror. 
So this is really the concept behind what I call backscatter communication. And I will give you an, another example of what is backscatter and communication. And there's a little trick. When I come from finger position eight, I will first only move my fingers. And then if I go to this position, which I call position five, then I will also move my wrist and turn it and um, close my fingers together. So what you see here, sorry, I, I make a mistake and I'm trying to, okay. So what you see in this very simple example by Carolina Haig, she's playing an instrument called the theremin. Theremin actually uh, is the name of this um, instrument that was uh, invented by Leon Theremin. Leon Theremin was uh, were, was an acoustic um, engineer, and he actually came up with this very interesting instrument. And as you saw, what she did, she actually moved her hand, and by moving the hand, she actually put this instrument to play music. And how this music plays? Well, this music plays, let me go back. And there's a little trick. When I come from finger position eight, I will first only move my fingers. So what you see is that she actually play music by reflection of electromagnetic waves by their hand. Actually, it's not really a reflection. What she's doing, she's uh, changing the, the, the resonance of a specific cavity. And by changing the resonance, she can change the pitch and she can change the audio of her music. And this is really what it's called the backscatter batteryless paradigm. And uh, if you look on top, what you see is the first instrument that actually was built by Leon Theremin. That's why I showed the Theremin instrument. And what he did, he actually built a Pi microphone without using any battery. What you can see in these photos is actually the United States ambassador complaining that this uh, gift was given to the US embassy in Moscow, and actually it was put in the living room. And it was there for, for several years. And at the, after several years, they discovered that actually inside there was an acoustic chamber connected with an antenna. And uh, actually you can see it here. So this is the American Eagle. Uh, this is a replica of that spy instrument and uh, courtesy of, of my colleague, Simon Emmer of the University of Bordeaux. I actually see it working uh, last year during the wireless power transfer conference in exhibition. And how this works? Well, this works very easily. You have a resonance chamber and when you talk, you change a membrane of this resonant chamber. And this membrane changes the capacity of uh, the impedance that is connected to an antenna. The antenna is a quarter wavelength, well, alpha wavelength antenna. And what happens is that if you transmit a signal to this antenna, and this antenna is connected to impedance, when the impedance changes, the reflected signal changes. So if the reflected signal changes, you just have to actually measure the envelope of the reflection signal. If you, if you measure the uh, envelope of the reflection signal, you can actually measure the sound that is affecting the change of this capacitive element. And this was the first backscatter system, and this was uh, actually the first batteryless microphone done. And how can we do this in our ICT world, in our digital inter um, information and communication technology uh, solutions? Well, very easily, if you have an antenna, if you short circuit the antenna, there is a backscatter wave, you, you radiate your antenna, and there is a backscatter wave if the antenna is short circuit. If the antenna is matched, all the signal that comes to the antenna will be collected by this load. So what happens is that what we need to do is actually to open and close the antenna. 
So if you open and close the match of this antenna, if you match or unmatch the antenna, you can send back a signal with zeros or ones. And actually, this is the principle of all RFID solutions, especially passive RFID solutions, where you can have you have a transmitter. This transmitter goes to your antenna. You have an RF to DC converter to convert RF signal back to a DC. This DC uh, will power up a very low power microcontroller. And this po low power microcontroller will affect the backscatter. And the backscatter is as simple as a switch that can be implemented with an RF transistor. So on, off, on, off, on, off. It's very, very simple to do. And actually, by combining the concept of wireless power transmission with the backscatter sensors, and with the transceivers of Marconi, uh, actually combining the knowledge of these three persons, you can build a very nice swiped solution, simultaneously wireless information and power transmission sensor. And this is actually, sorry, let me uh, try to take out the sound. This is actually what you see here. You have a transmitter. This was done in my lab. The transmitter is here, is the active antenna array I showed you before. Uh, we use a lens to focus the energy. Actually, this is a dielectric lens that we use to focus the energy on our receiver so that we can increase our receiver as much as we can. And here, what you see is the producing of this lens, this dielectric lens. In this case, we actually were able uh, at 5.8 gigahertz to power up and to operate a solution at uh, two meters. And we transmit 10 watts and we collect around 1.5, 1.8 watts at two meters. So that was the actually way to power up these sensors. And then we start to build our sensors. What type of sensors we build? Well, here you see one of the first sensors we build. This is our backscatter modulator with a single switch. This is our RF to DC converter with a Dixon multiplier. And the, we have a very low power microcontroller. And what we did here, we actually use a, a solution that is a traditional solution that um, you can use and we, you normally use for RFIDs. It's a binary phase shift king, or if you want, is an amplitude shift king. And uh, one point of the, the switch uh, is uh, the your antenna is matched. On another um, uh, position of the switch, your antenna is unmatched. So you can change this match to unmatch in both these situations what was the problem where we were talking about kilobit per second and we want more we would love to have gigabit per second on these passive sensors so in order to increase the data rate we come up with another idea instead of using as we did in this scenario we only have a switch there instead of using one switch we decide to use two switches and these two switches as you can see here this is actually our backscatter so it, this is our backscatter modulator and actually if you see both of them they are exactly equal but each but this branch is a little bit longer than this branch what that means it means that for the frequency we use one of these branches was 90 degree apart from the other branch so what we actually did here was a night Q modulator by changing the impedance in IQ form. And uh, actually, this allows us to go to gigabit per second by creating, for instance, a 16 QAM on top of SME chart. So instead of creating two impedances like Teremin did, we can actually create a 16 impedance or even more, depends on the resolution you, you have, uh, on top of SME chart. And so you can, uh, since this is a 16 QAM, you can uh, actually uh, code four bits for each symbol and you can create a very important and a very interesting solution for this. So then we put our backscatter in that spot and we actually build a new uh, receiver with an IQ modulator and a Dixon multiplier. And if we compare to what was um, the state of the art at that time, 
we were able to go almost one gigabit per second with almost no power consumption. Actually, we were very, very, very high efficiency at that time. And then uh, this was a large prototype. So we decided to actually put this in a very tiny IQ modulator. And you can see here all the solution. And uh, our IQ modulator is this ship. And I will give a uh, zoom in. So our ship, our IQ modulator was integrated in a very tiny um, uh, integrated circuit, MMIC design, and in this case, this was operating at 26 gigahertz for uh, some of our uh, example scenarios. Well, but can we do better? Because in these scenarios, I was actually transmitting an RF signal for my sensor. The situation is, can we improve this solution? Can we improve the amount of power I sent to the um, tech. And actually, uh, uh, Professor Joshua Schmidt uh, came up, uh, is a professor in Washington, came up with an idea of using Wi Fi ambient signals to actually use the Wi Fi signal as our source of energy. And then you backscatter the Wi Fi signal. So you can do that with Wi Fi signals, then others did with a cell tower. And in Aveiro, we actually did it with a music FM station. And uh, we backscatter the music FM station and we use a four PAM. So it's a four level modulation format to send information back. And then we receive that with a very low cost. R RTL software defined radio approach. So the problem with these solutions, uh, our solutions using wireless power or the solutions using ambient backscatter is that the coverage is not very high because we actually are using amplitude shift keying, PAM, quadrature amplitude modulation. And in order to operate that, you need a huge signal to noise ratio to actually a very good Mod demodulating formats. But we thought on a way to actually extend the range of our sensors. And in order to do that, we redesigned our backscatter tag. So here you can see a, a brand new backscatter tag, more efficient backscatter tag. You continue to see the two transistors, 90 degree apart, similar approach. The only difference is that now I'm no longer using only 16 impedances. <clears throat> so what we did, we in this VG1, so in this connector and this connector, we changed the voltage from zero from I, I don't remember exactly the value, but let's assume from zero to five volts. And you do all this voltage in a very tiny step. And when you do this in both of these voltages, you see that you can cover a huge amount of impedances in your Smith chart. So if you save the amount of voltages for each one of these points in a lookup table, what happens is that if I want to do an amplitude shift king, I go to the lookup table, I select this voltage and this voltage, and you have two points on your Smith chart. If I want to do a 16.4 QAM, you go to your voltage lookup table and you select 16.4 points for 64 impedances. And you can do whatever you want. And what we did, we actually select the voltages that allow us to go around the Smith chart in a circle. Why is a circle very important? Because if you know a little bit about modulation formats, you can see that if you go in a circle, you are actually implementing a frequency modulated, so a frequency, uh, a frequency modulated scheme. So you are doing actually frequency modulation and if you do it slowly or if you do it faster your frequency modulation will be lower and faster solution so you can actually create what it's called a sharp fem signal and why is this important well this is important because a sharp fem signal is the type of signal the more recent uh, protocol standards for Internet of Things use, like for instance, LoRa or LoRa One, and actually we designed this in our lookup table. This was a very precise circular device. When we actually measured it, it was not so circular. But if you look to the time in domain, you can actually see that you can do a sharp FM signal. So you can extend your range, and we actually went 
from uh, I think it was five meter the first experiments to ten and and more in the second experiments. And then we go back to what I show you before, uh, because I show you that in Portugal we are spending twenty three million batteries per year only for your remote control. So actually, what you see here is a shipless, no, sorry, not shipless, sorry, a, a batteryless device where we change each button by one backscatter radio. And in this case, our backscatter radio sends an ID to your receiver. So I'll go back and I will come forward. You see, this is the traditional infrared remote control. What we did, we substitute that with our tag. Our tag is like this. It has four buttons. And when we change, we click on these buttons. You see here how much voltage we are getting from our transmitter. And this is the traditional infrared. Now we are going to change to our batteryless device and you can see that we were changing the tv channel so this means that we can actually do uh, even remote controls without batteries so we save at least in portugal 23 million batteries per year and uh, as i told you before we did some uh, solutions for using this um, very simple chimney uh, rotators to implement Internet of Things solutions for smart city environment. This is actually how much power you can get based on wind speed that we are getting. And uh, of course, we did other smart city options. And one of the smart city options we did was instead of using a switch and uh, transmitting digital information, we thought of using piezo resistive material. When you have a piezo resistive material, what is going to happen is that if you connect that to your antenna, when you change the piezo resistive material, the impedance of the antenna changes. So if you measure the backscatter signal, you can have an information of if someone is actually putting a pressure on your piezo resistive material. So here you can see actually someone crossing a road. If it is foggy, nobody knows if the person is crossing a road or not. So we come up with an idea, a very simple idea. We bought a lot of piezo resistive materials on the market. We connect that to our backscatter radio and we actually send a signal to your crosswalk sensor and you receive it on the receiving antenna and here you can actually see one example of what we did and on this video you see you have the transmitting antennas on the other side we have our sensor here the antenna is here and uh, actually we are expecting to measure when someone comes and you see here my student she will come she will touch the sensors and inside the car you'll have an information that someone is crossing the road or is not crossing the road so this is the experiment indoor so when uh, she put the uh, leg the foot here you see a green light when she moves out of the leg you, you see that there is a black light and this is the real thing when she's going to go and inside the car we are actually seeing that someone is crossing the road. So that means that someone uses the, this road. What is important on this project is that we don't use any battery. It was purely a piezo resistive material connected, of course, matched to a transmitting antenna. Well, we can actually do similar things. And in this case, you see, we are not using transistors, neither diodes, nothing, only a piezo resistive material connected with a, uh, an antenna. We did a, another example where actually you put a sensor on a, a, a bank and each time you go to this chair and you sit, you know someone sits in the chair. We then try to do another thing. We put this on, on, on the chest of a person. And it is curious that when you breathe, you see here, when you breathe, you see the lines, uh, you can actually measure if a person is breathing or not without any ship. It is, is a shipless backscatter solution. And uh, then COVID came. And when COVID came, we start to think, well, it will be nice to measure the temperature of all our students. And when we um, start to look on the market, how can we do that? We found this 
solutions. These solutions are the problem. You have to touch almost the person to measure the temperature of the person. Uh, or you can have a very fancy infrared cameras to actually measure the temperature of all these persons. What is the problem again? Well, the problem is that the cost is, was very, very high for these infrared cameras. So we come up with an idea to use a shipless tag. It's a concept is similar to actually the backscatter radio. You have a antenna that actually you can glue to, to your arm. You can glue, actually pick up a piece of meat and we put it in a, a, a temperature oven. And what happens here is when you hit the, actually the, the surface, uh, you have two uh, um, changes. You have a permittivity change and also the length and the size of the uh, tag will change. And by changing, you can actually measure the reflection that comes from this tag and you can, sorry, and you can actually receive that information back and uh, make a calibration and figure out how much temperature the person has. Well, the last example I will give you is a, a new solution that we have been working for trains. And this, the issue is similar. So we want to measure the temperature of the track here when a train comes by and we want to see if the track is being heated or not so we come up with an idea that actually what they normally do they put a sensor there with the battery and then they need to go and change the battery periodically or they can have a sensor and then they have wires and they can measure what comes out of these wires what is the problem the problem is when they do that when the train passes after a certain time the uh, wires break and they need to actually repair those cables. So we come up with an idea, similar idea. We have a tag, we have a diode. And in this case, we are not actually doing RF to DC. We are doing what is called an harmonic tag. So we receive a signal, RF signal. It goes through the diode and it creates a second harmonic. And we backscatter that second harmonic. What that means, it means that the signal that comes back is at the double frequency of the signal that comes in. And why is this important? Because the signal to noise ratio is now better because you are receiving in a different frequency that you are transmitting. But in this case, we actually found that the diode, if the diode is connected to the track, each time the temperature of the track changes, the diode current changes. And by changing the diode current, the power of second harmonic goes up and down. So you can calibrate this sensor and you can have a single diode sensor without batteries, without wires, measuring the track and measure it one or two meters away to actually collect that information. So uh, this was the last uh, example I give you. Uh, of course, this is not done only by myself. This is done by a group of a significant number of PhD students, postdoc students, master students. Uh, here is only a small amount of them because at the time we took this photo, they were not all uh, with me. We need to uh, do a new photo. And by the way, if you are interested on these topics, there is a very nice community being put together in IEEE, wpt.ieee.org. And if you are interested in what we are doing in our group, wpt.it.pt, uh, our webpage is under development, but uh, uh, everything will be there. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm now open for uh, questions. Thank you. Wow, Professor Cavallo. I mean, you know, you have taken a pretty niche subject and wowed us and through your art of storytelling, somebody like myself who knew very little about this at the beginning, I feel like I'm an expert now. So we've got some, we've we've got a question already from uh, Saraj in the in the chat, and he asks, will we be able to harvest energy from the charged particles in the ionosphere in the future? Well, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I will say probably um, what we are doing is uh, not actually following the directly what Tesla 
uh, was thinking, which was to use the ionosphere to, to actually exchange energy. But we have been looking carefully to how we can send RF signals from a transmitter to a receiver. So in our case, um, uh, we um, expect to actually focus the energy. And I think this is, is the challenge. How can we focus the energy on our receiver? And why I think this is a challenge, because um, most of the RF radio frequency solutions that we have are uh, thought in terms of telecommunications. And mm. for telecommunications, you try to increase the number of uh, receivers because you want to communicate to a large amount of uh, persons. While in energy, uh, wireless energy, you want to send energy to a specific point. So um, the the let's say the the focus is is fundamental. I think if we send energy to the ionosphere and then uh, charge receive that those particles or charge particles from the ionosphere, it is a possibility. But uh, I believe we will need a significant uh, amount of energy being sent there, and I don't know if this is uh, sustainable. At the end of or not. We have a question from Shuras Chandra. How do we improve the efficiency of batteries as the energy taken from a battery is less than what it is used for its charging? So we're yeah. talking about the recharging of batteries there. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a very good question. And, and actually, if you look to batteries, my idea is to remove the battery. So kill them all <laughs> immediately. Uh, how we are doing that in certain situations, you cannot remove the battery of the sensor because when there is not a flow of energy, you need to, to maintain the sensor alive. So the sensor should continue to be monitoring the environment. So what we are doing in those situations is change the battery by what it's called a supercapacitor. So a supercapacitor was possible to built with these new nanotechnology um, solutions. And you can uh, charge a supercapacitor that allows you to maintain the sensor alive with less losses than a, a traditional battery. And more important, a supercapacitor can be charged and recharged almost, I will not say indefinitely, but um, a significant number, uh, uh, bigger number, m more time than, than an actually charging a battery. So my proposal in that situation is really to remove the battery and try to change it by another type of um, charging capability, which in our case, I think a supercapacitor is one of the options. So are you talking about, you know, you, you talked about the remote control at the beginning, and I mean, there's batteries and there's batteries, right? There's the personal battery that we would have in the house versus these giant batteries all of the energy that's being spent on lithium, for example. Um, so are you are you suggesting that we're coming to the end of the era of the battery in all batteries and we're going to almost a, a radio frequency view of the world? Is, is the battery going the same way as the as the CD as the yeah. CD player? Is that what you're is that where we're headed? This is what I would like. <laughs> Give us but, your dream. Yeah, exactly. That's the dream. So uh, I, I will say it in a different way. As I was saying, for these small sensors, the remote control, and some of these small gadgets we have around, like our watch, our smartphone, probably this kind of new solutions as um, the capacitor, supercapacitors, and so on, can actually change the batteries because the amount of energy we need is, is not very large. For cars and, and other type of solutions, I think we cannot remove the battery completely. Right. But uh, imagine, I, I, I show one slide where um, there are some colleagues around the world trying to put inductors behind the streets. So imagine that when you are driving a highway, you are charging your, your car, you have this um, inductive charging. So at the end, you don't need a large battery because you are not spending the battery energy, you are taking the energy out of the road. So you only need the battery to go from the highway, for instance, to your house. So uh, I will call it the last mile from the right. big roads to your, your local house. So in that situations, I will not say remove the batteries completely, but at least reduce it significantly to the minimum as you can to do the last mile of the road. 
And, and again, what you're almost talking about is we could have this situation with even further combinations of technology where you have this on the road and a driverless car that's following and exactly. at the same yeah okay so it's 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 mind blowing and and it, and you talked about science fiction and in fact I'm going to get Gabriella to um just pop in the the series that we currently have on science fiction yeah. uh with writers with nature because I mean it really you know it really is out of this world um you also talked about chipless technology and 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 so is my understanding that that we're also potentially not going to need a microchip is that what this and, and again I, I and as you know we talk about um transdisciplinarity at the isc and i think about certain countries where microchip technology is a lot of based on their economies and so this has huge potentials for the way we, we build things and make things and, and societies run and cohesiveness happens um talk to talk to us a little about that yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I talked briefly about shipless uh, mm. solutions, so shipless sensors. And um, I I think we, at a certain point, we need a microcontroller at the control stage. But the sensors itself, they don't really need, need to have a local microcontroller in the sensor. Because as I show, if we use these piezoelectric or piezoresistive materials, the material is, I, I will use a word that probably is not the correct word to use here, they are intelligence, in, they have the intelligence to actually change their behavior depending on a specific uh, sensing that they are doing. For instance, uh, with the piezoelectric, when you bend the material, it will change or the voltage, you'll produce a voltage, or if it is a piezoresistive, you'll change the impedance, so the value of the resistance when you change mm -hmm. this value. So if you are able to capture this, you don't really need a microcontroller to do this type of things at the sensor, but I believe you need a microcontroller at reader. So you, my idea is that imagine that you have sensors in your house, you can have uh, something like a Wi-Fi access point that you have in your house to, to have Wi-Fi in the house, and the, the intelligence, the microcontroller should be there, not on the sensors. So that way you can create this shipless sensor in the sense that they sense the environment they can be very low cost so that you can create trillions of devices for ship and they should consume almost no energy so that you can produce them as much as you can so in that sense i think the sensors can go that way mm. if uh, you want to maximize and if you want to create what they call the internet of everything, where everything is connected to the internet. But uh, I will say there will be at a certain point, they call it now edge computing, or if you want, they call it the access point of Wi-Fi. And then you need some intelligence there. So you need a microcontroller there that will manage all these uh, activities. Um we, we don't have much time left, but is there anybody who's currently on the webinar right now who would like to come in and ask a question or is going to be brave and come in and ask a question of Professor Cavallo? While we're waiting for people to think, Professor um, Alec uh, Ismail Zadeh also had a bit more of a question around this idea of science as a global public good and the way that we use technologies you know, for, for, and he's, he's listed, you know, concerns with AI and the consequences of discovery. So, you know, what are the consequences of this kind of new technology? Um, if we think about uh, technology for the public good, the technology that benefits everyone. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you've taken us from the personal battery all the way up to space where we might harness you know, space. And I know that I have conversations with with friends who are not part of the scientific community who sometimes get quite angry about the amount of scientific endeavour that goes into space. But this is a very good example of how it's it's a critical conversation for building us towards net zero. So, so can you talk about that as we as we close the webinar? Yeah, for sure. So, um, this is a very good. The question because um, when we talk about collecting energy out of space and bring it to earth 
everybody says you are crazy. It's 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 a lot of power. It's completely science fiction. But um, I think the European Space Agency they did a very nice um, uh, work, and so they put together two consulting companies. Uh, one is from UK, the other one is from Germany, uh, looking to the technical, economic feasibility of such a solution. And what they found is that actually, uh, if you do that, if you have the capability to collect energy in space and bring it to ground, this will be more cost effective than if you have um, uh, solar panels on Earth. And uh, I normally tell my students, um, if you have a big solar farm, so solar panels in a huge uh, area, uh, we are going to have a huge amount of problems. First, you are going to occupy a lot of land. Mm -hmm. uh, you are going to stop the sun to touch the ground because it will be on, uh, directly to the solar, solar panels. At, after 15 to 20 years, we have to recycle the solar panels. So we have another <laughs> problem there. Uh, and we have a, a problem that solar panels, in uh, if you put it on ground, they have probably eight, nine hours of solar, and then the rest of the time it's dark. So you, you are not producing energy. On top of that, the atmosphere filters some wavelengths coming from the sun. So you lose also power there. So if you collect this energy in space and you bring it to ground, then I think... Um, it will be more cost effective, as I said. And on top of that, you can do what it's called power on demand. What that means, uh, if you have a earthquake, for instance, and uh, there is no cables to bring energy mm -hmm. to, to hospitals and things like that, you can redirect the energy, a beam of energy to your hospital or to your house. So I know it's science fiction at this moment, but I believe there will be solutions in the future in this sense. And probably the first one will be uh, to deliver energy on the moon for some exploration. Right. So, but probably then we will continue for, for other applications in the future. I'm going to bring in um, Keanu Manara. Gabriella, if you can just unmute uh, <laughs> Keanu. Yes, come in, Keanu, and ask your question, and Hello. then we must close. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. First of all, thank you for the inspiring presentation. And uh, I just, uh, I was just wondering, because you know that in big city, we have uh, a lot of uh, communication systems. So uh, I was wondering, and uh, I would like to have uh, your opinion about the possibility of distributing several sensors everywhere in the wall of the buildings and so on, chipless sensors that could give you, as a spin-off of the communication systems, some information about the environment in the, in the big cities. Also in the countryside, but there you have less communication system, and so you can uh, have less uh, backscattered signals. But... Uh, I, I would like to have your opinion because you know I'm working on chipless RFID and so yes, they, thank think. thank you thank you for for the question and 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 you're right. So if you go to uh, cities, there is um, already an energy um, available on the air. So you have it from mobile phones, you have it from uh, RFIDs, Wi-Fi, and so on and so on. So there are a significant number of those sensors. If you look at this moment inside a house, for instance, uh, the amount of the, the energy density is not very high. And um, I hope it will maintain like that because um, if, if it's very high, probably will have an impact on human um, uh, factors but if you go to the outside of the houses i agree with you actually i can uh, tell you that with the master student some years ago we we actually made a very simple experiment we found a, a, a digital tv broadcaster in in the middle of my city we point an antenna there and we put a watch uh, one of these digital watches being charged by this um, energy you you can do that and you can do as I was showing, you can do shipless. 
uh, tags like, uh, for instance, Joshua Schmidt did with the ambient backscatter. What is the problem I see with the ambient backscatter at this moment is that they backscatter the signal they receive. So when you are backscattering, you are interfering. So you are increasing the noise at that communication uh, channel. So this should be discussed with uh, our local FCC guys so that we don't increase the noise so much that you degrade the quality of the communications, but you can do it. So it's it's viable to do it. Um, but we have to see also this other layer that is interference. How can we actually do it without increasing the noise so much that will jeopardize the communication channel? Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giano, for joining us. That was great. And look, I'm afraid that it's uh, 20 past the hour and we have to, to say goodbye. But uh, Professor Cavallo, I mean, this has been uh, an enlightening and engaging discussion. And for those members who haven't been able to join today, I hope that they will watch this recording because it has been uh, truly magical to listen to your art of storytelling. No, uh, <laughs> actually, Alexandra from the IUG, did you want to come in and ask a question? I see that you've turned off your mic. Obrigado, Nuno. Thank you, Alison, for this excellent session. And it was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. <laughs> a, a wonderful endorsement from our GEO unions. And uh, we're very thankful to the GEO unions who have put this series together. So I'm going to take this opportunity to thank you again. Um, and thank ISC members and colleagues and the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development. Um, do check our events pages on the, the ISC webpage, council.science. Um, the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development will have a closing ceremony on the 15th of December. And part of that will be a, a hybrid event and you can tune in from wherever you are in the world. So thanks again. I'm going to wish everyone a good evening or a good morning, depending on where you are in the world and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much.